All right, guys, so what do you think? Uh, was a canceled series that should be either revived or uh, was ended before its time? Like, I, I think, uh, Rob, you were talking a little earlier about uh, Sword of Sorcery. What do, you, what do you think? That book was an interesting sort of... Uh, it was a departure, I guess, for DC. Like, they revived the Amethyst Princess of Gemworld character for... Uh, for this, it was supposed to be an anthology book, so it had it had uh, Amethyst as the starter, and then it had a fall. Uh, what do you call those? A backup. Yeah, back. <laughs> it had a backup story after it that you'd read that was totally different, not even related. So, uh, for Amethyst, though, rather than like mining the history of the character, they created this whole new world, and the whole new world was really kind of like. In, it was intense, and I feel like it was the kind of thing that might have shut out new readers or been too elaborate in some way. But and it it also took place in like a totally alternate reality, not not alternate reality, but like a alternate dimension, I guess. Like Gem World is an alternate dimension, and so that had little room for crossover, little room for being part of the DCU, and so that maybe didn't appeal to people. But you liked it, though? Yeah, I thought it was a really strong book, like very good storytelling. And the, uh, I mean, despite it being about gems, like being, it was kind of like toyetic. You like, you know that phrase toyetic, like everything is associated with a different kind of gemstone, so it's kind of novel in that respect. But in if you can get over that, it's a pretty interesting world that they built. It's funny you should say that because when I was uh, role playing, like when I was like much much younger, I used to play in a, a role playing series uh, called Champions or Heroes, um, and I actually created a character whose like main power he basically got this gemstone from an alien world uh, called the Drep Stone, and I was like ten years old when I invented this, so you can just go with me on that that sort of level of you know writing I had. But it's called the Drep Stone. It was diamond, ruby, emerald, pearl, and sapphire, and the idea is that sort of each not entirely dissimilar from the Infinity Gauntlet and the various gems there, but it imbued him with these powers, and he was chosen by this alien race to be the savior of Earth. So it kind of had this blended Superman, you know, uh, slash Infinity Gauntlet thing going on. It was pretty crazy, but uh, it's toyetic. I didn't know there was a term for that sort of... Uh, well, it means like it could be turned into a toy, like... Yeah, well, imagine the Drep Stone, right? Like, it's a character. Like, here's your figure, and it comes with this weird colored thing that just, like... There's no good explanation. It's a colored thing. Just take it and give us shut up and give us your money. You know, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, uh, Kyle, did, you said you read uh, sort of sorcery too. Is that right? Yeah, I read it. Uh, I kind of felt the same way Rab did. Uh, it was just kind of. I think for me, there was more of like a political intrigue storyline going on too. Like you know, Amethyst was kind of destined or, or born into this. Uh, this world, but she grew up on Earth, so she didn't understand you know, all the, the intricacies of the politics on her home world, and you know who was who ruled each of the houses, and you know there was you know her aunt was trying to assassinate her mother and her so that she could uh, gather all the power that was uh, given out to the members of the house within herself, and so there was all this assassination plots and things like that going on that just made the book seem a little more intricate and complex than a lot of the books going on at that time. And so I felt like that was really, it really made it a different book in, in just terms of storytelling. And then the Aaron Lepresti art was just gorgeous. I, I'd read a lot of his stuff before, and it was like a step above what anything he's ever done. He just created this whole, a whole new world of, of characters and, and, you know, scenery and just everything was just, was just beautiful artwork. I really liked it, the artwork on that book. So you'd agree that if that book came back, you'd be up for buying more? I would buy more. The problem is I think it would get about another six or seven issues, and it would be canceled again. Just Was it because there wasn't enough story arc, the mythos wasn't deep enough, or was think, it because the characters are sort of derivative? I, I don't think it's any of that. I just think that Amethyst is kind of such a, a non-brand name character for DC that it's hard to generate interest in it, and I think... You know, the Princess of Gemworld thing kind of turns a lot of, especially male fans, away. You know, thinking maybe it's, you know, a book for a 13-year-old girl or something like that. Rab, do you agree with that? 
No, I'm just finding it ironic that we're both men who read this book. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think I'd have to go ahead and disagree if your entire premise is that guys won't buy it, and the only people I know that have bought it are guys. So. Um, yeah, and then, then you go into the whole My Little Pony Brony thing. So, I mean, it's possible to make a book that is interesting to, uh, you know, we'll say non-conventional audiences. But um, So DC is an interesting one because... Um, actually, much like Marvel, they typically don't kill off long-running series. Like, what is Batman at now? Like, eight hundred something or something? Well, it's it's killed off. That like Batman. Well, the, I mean, yeah, but that's that was a, a result of New Fifty Two, right? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that wasn't changed. That wasn't killed off because Batman wasn't selling properly. You know, like holy crap! Like, how many series is he in like now? Right, four or five? Like he's, holding down some, he's holding down a lot of titles, right? And he always has and he always will. So it's interesting how, uh, especially the big two, hold their, we'll say, flagship uh, series to these numerical, like, just behemoths of series. And, uh, you know, going back to what we were talking about earlier with Marvel, it was interesting to see Marvel kill Spider-Man, end the series at 700. I mean, not really 700, but anyway. End the series at 700, start a new series, and now they're back at, you know, Amazing Spider-Man Volume 2 type thing. And it's like, I mean, there's two ways you can kill a series. It's not enough sales, and you just end the series permanently, or you do something funny with the numbering to generate more sales because you think people will buy more number ones or or because you want to change the, the character that's holding down the title or, or, you know, that type of thing. It's it's weird. Like, what what do you think DC would... Do you think DC would ever um, try and do that type of, you know, 800-issue run again? Is that, that going to be... Is this the end of the long run? That's a good question. I think it's tough because they just did this New 52 thing, and the whole point of the New 52 is that when you get these 900-issue runs, that they're going to be like, I don't want to... Like, that, that readers are going to feel shut out by it because it's too many, like it's too high a number, so clearly you you should have been there at number one reading all 900 issues. So, I mean, that's ludicrous, but I think people don't realize how, just how uh, insular, like, story arcs are. Like, they go, like, six issues. You can jump on six issues, typically, or three issues, like... You can jump on at the beginning of stories. It's not one whole 900 issues story. Right, but I mean, now with you know the non-flagship series, they typically call those maxis, right? Maxis are minis. You have a mini that's somewhere between four and six issues and a maxi that could be a dozen issues. I mean, those are pretty, uh, as you say, insular or, or encapsulated. Um, it's more um, psychologically... Um, yeah, it's, it's psychologically easier to jump on issue one. And, it, it, and I've actually seen, especially in the 90s, they did this a lot where it would say issue one of 12. And so you, you kind of know what your investment is going in. You know, okay, you know, $2 a comic or whatever it was back in the 90s uh, times 12. I know 24 bucks later I'm going to have a nice uh, contained story arc where I'm not going to miss anything. Um, but I think something Marvel and DC uh, like to do regardless of the numbering scheme and regardless of these mini-maxi issues is they tie stuff in. Uh, right now Marvel's doing Original Sin, and you know they'll, they'll invariably want to interact the characters that are in that series with something that's going on in the big summer event or the big story arc that's going on in the main, in the main universe. So I, I, I think it's... I, I don't want to say it's a gimmick, but I want to say that no matter what they do with the numbering scheme, at the end of the day... Um, they're gonna try. They're gonna try whatever tactic they can to get you to buy more books in other series that you're not currently buying. And I think that the only, the number one reason why they're not doing these 800 book series anymore is because, like you say, psychologically it's tough to jump on at issue 426. You feel like you've missed out on a bunch of stuff. Well, I, I believe think. it was uh, Joe Quesada. Joe Quesada. Um, yeah, the uh, pre <laughs> Joe Quesada. You're not Spanish. I am not Spanish. Uh, Joe Quesada had uh, said that the like its lifespan for a reader for comic books was only two years, and that's what they really had to focus on for their comic book series because after that point you're going to lose like that audience because they'll jump onto something else other than the, like the diehard comic book readers, and that like I guess that's what their main focus is that two year span to like run a series in, and then after that, you need to switch it up and do something new with the characters. I guess that's how. That's why you can only expect certain series to last that long. Like, 
a 12 issue se like a a series that only makes it to 12 issues like the movement like maybe people just couldn't hold on that long maybe that's just the the death of the or that's a weird thing to say but maybe that's just the uh, lifespan cut off point yeah the lifespan of their interest but i was thinking of how to me it signals the death of a series when a book starts crossing over like a book that's that was previously not crossing over with anything suddenly like superman's there and you don't like why is he there he's just there so that you're like ooh superman's in this book better buy it up and it doesn't like it might cause sales to spike but i feel like as a reader who's been who's stuck with the book to that point it's like this book is floundering. I should jump ship. And it's it's just a pain in the butt to me that they can't just stick to their guns and die with dignity. That's well, true because, I mean, with the uh, Cable Deadpool series, um, they went through the majority of the book. I mean, they did do a small crossover at, like, about issue 15, 16, 17, uh, where they went through the uh, House of M storyline, but they just briefly touched into it. But, like, further down in the series, they got into the whole Civil War, and that became, like, a major part of the storyline. And shortly thereafter, the, the series kind of just started falling apart, and just, like, it died. So it's it's really funny that you say that, because I can completely agree. I think the, the that's tough to say about series that, that go into, like, House of M, Civil War, things that, like, that's editorial push from the from the top like we are doing a summer event like this is the event for the four period the four month period that is you know peak sales or whatever whatever it is they're going to do or try to get readers back in like editorial pushes that down and says look you're going to have to do something that ties in we're going to depower every freaking mutant in the entire universe your book cannot stand alone from that like it is or or you know spider-man's going to reveal his identity to the world you can't not say have something to say about that so as much as you know these interactions and crossovers may be the jumping the shark repellent as it were uh uh you can catch my reference there um it, as the much as that may be the case, it actually may be pre-planned, like, to a certain extent. Like, you have to imagine when editorial comes to you and says, look, we're going to do this thing, you're, you're either in or you're out, um, then you, you kind of wrap up whatever you're working on, you know, close your storyline down and let it fade, let it, uh, let it wrap up into the, the main story. If we ever do get a guest writer on here that has had a canceled series, I would love to ask them all about, like, the process of how that slowly died off. Because a lot of the times it's not the original person who started off the series that ends up, like, canceling. I mean, some cases with your short 12-story 12, 12 arcs, yeah, it is. But, like, in the case of, like, Cable and Deadpool, it started off with someone completely different than who ended the series, so... I feel like if they want to keep working, they won't be able to tell us. <laughs> yeah, well, you'd be surprised. They uh, they're very they're very good at playing the political game and answering these questions. So so uh, on that on sort of on that point, like we um, so there's 12 issue runs. Um, you know, it's a maxi series. It's one by one issues. Either comes out weekly or, or monthly or whatever they've decided. But something that they've been doing in the last, we'll call it 20 years. Uh, maybe it's been less than that, but it's sort of trade paperbacks. I mean, back in the Back in the day, you didn't see these sort of, um, you know, omnibuses or, or uh, collections. Um, I think that it's nice that they do these for people that want to just say, you know, catch back on to, um, you know, the Killing Joke, 1980, what was it, eight or whatever. And I don't want to go, you know, hunting through my shop to get individual issues. But then it also gives people the ability to say. I see something coming out now, I'm not going to buy a single issue, but I'm going to buy the trade when it comes out. Like They're pre-planning to buy the trade, which is another interesting thing. Yeah, I mean, trades really went interesting for a while, because like at first, I guess, they started out, and they were like just collections of like storylines. It wasn't even just like one storyline, but sometimes you had like two or three storylines within a trade. And then slowly over time now, you're getting trades that are only six issues now. And it's like, we have have determined that this trade for, like, say, Wonder Woman and Blood is going to be the first six issues of this series, and that's what we're doing. Like, that's all that trade is, and it's predetermined that this will come out on this date. Like, it almost comes out within, like, 
I don't know, like a month, maybe weeks after that series, like that that storyline ends, and boom, the trade's out ready for people so that they can purchase because they've seen that only certain demographics buy that in a trade paperback and they'll hit them, be able to get the money out of them, and like they won't buy the individual series. They'll just wait for that trade. And when you talk about trades and how they, like people wait for the trade, there's this sort of perception that trades kill the series, and I think that's maybe true to an extent. Like, if nobody's buying it until like six or a year, six months or a year after the issues came out, then it's not going to last six months. It's not going to last another six issues for another trade. You just, just, uh, it's just going to die. And um, I think that's an argument for like. Rather than, like, the, people have made the argument in the past that instead of doing, like, 900 issues series or even, like, just ongoing series, they should just publish, like, six issues and then another six issues. Or, like Kyle said, he would probably only, or Sword of Sorcery would probably only last another six issues. Maybe that's all it should have. And then maybe later they'll get another six issues and people will buy those. But it won't, like... It's a small amount of money in a short period of time rather than slowly losing money on a series as it dies for the yeah, publisher. Yeah, and, and I, I agree with you, actually, and more than me agreeing because my opinion is not worth anything. Uh, I've been to many, many conventions and been to many Marvel and DC panels, and I've actually heard that response, like... Someone at you know on the panel will invariably say like Nick Lowe or someone will say, "Hey, how are you liking blah 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 series right now?" And everybody will clap and everything's great. And then you know someone will come up to the mic, one of the fans will have a silly question and come up and say, "Oh yeah, loving you know what I've been reading online. Totally interested in reading this, but I'm waiting for the trade." And you immediately see the entire panel sink into their chairs when when someone says, "I'm waiting for the trade." Like, it, it kills sales, and I mean, as much as it may be the greatest series ever, if everyone says I'm waiting for the trade, it'll never make it beyond the first or second trade, and that's it. So it's it's kind of this weird dichotomy in terms of sales. Like, you have to buy the individual issues, or at least there has to be someone buying the individual issues in order to justify the trade in the first place, and then if everybody's just waiting for the trade, the trade will never happen. So it's this self-fulfilling prophecy of, of uh, never happening sales. And then with a series like The Movement, which only has 12 issues, they put out they just put out the first trade, but if not enough people buy the first trade, they won't put out the second trade that holds the other. So people who are waiting for the trade aren't even going to get to read the next six issues. So too bad for them. Kyle, what's your opinion on this? <laughs> I think, you know, I think what everyone's saying is right. I, I think what my solution would be would be maybe to have just any any character outside the big, you know, Superman, Spider-Man, Batman, people that cannot support an ongoing, maybe instead of trying to give them an ongoing, is to just give them a six-issue mini and just say, here's a, a short contained story with Amethyst or, you know, whoever, and, you know, if it sells well, you know, maybe you'll get another one in a year from now, you know, maybe we'll... Maybe if it really sells well, you can get an ongoing, but, hey, here's a story right now with this character that you like. Has there been has there been um, many direct to trade, like sort of these the concept that you know we're we are anticipating a fair amount of sales, so we're going to just put several books together in a larger sort of chunk and then put that straight out. I mean that doesn't seem financially viable in most cases because with you know individual issues you can kill it very quickly before you know you you sink all this money into it, but with sort of direct to trade, which would seem to skip this whole concept of waiting for the trade to come out. Don't you think that would be ideal if they could predict that kind of sale? I don't know. That's just a graphic novel, except a lot of the pe a lot of the books that we call graphic novels now were actually series before, so it's kind of... Yeah, I, I guess that's what I'm trying to get at, is graphic novels are intended to be a larger amount of work, but I just mean like a trade is more like individual issues that were sh released straight to home video kind of thing, you know what I mean? Um I don't know, just like like when you're starting the, the creative process, they're like, okay, we're going to do individual issues, and then they say, you know what, we're probably not going to be able to prop this up and keep this going weekly or monthly or whatever. Let's just combine it all and then just put it straight in a hardcover or something like that. Well, I think they do that not 
not so much with like trades, but they do like hundred page giants and things like that instead to just throw all of the crap into one larger book and be like, it's a special double sized issue. Please buy it. <laughs> really, please. We're taking a loss unless you do. But they're also doing the opposite. Like they're making little bite sized comics in the digital, like digital first comics that are like only ten pages. Like they amount to only 10 pages of a comic instead of 20, and then they're putting them out as print later. So that's kind of interesting, too. I, yeah, actually, I have no idea what to think of that. When they started announcing that, like, two, three years ago, when Marvel originally started teaming up with uh, Comixology, I had no idea what to think about that. I'm not generally a fan of digital comics. Love Comixology. My friends, I have a couple friends that work over there. Great company. Concept's beautiful. I prefer holding something, smelling something. It's you know collecting something. It's it's uh, part of the experience for me. What series do you want to see canceled? So what is an absolute pile of manure that you just are like? Why? How is this still going? I want Kyle to answer this. <laughs> I think they took care of, of mine recently with Teen Titans. Uh, so my wish came true on that one. But it's coming back still. Yeah, but it's a different it's a different writing team, so I mean, hopefully that will kind of solve the problems that Teen Titans had. Yeah, I th- yeah I think Teen Titans was I didn't want it to be canceled. I just wanted a totally refreshed book. Like I love Teen Titans when Jeff Johns was writing it, but now Scott Lobdell's version is just such a such a disease upon comic books in my opinion <laughs> and uh, that's not a book that I would kill well it's it's not a book I would kill but a book I would kill hmm I really I'm not even reading it but I want G- Superboy Green Lantern New Guardians uh, Lar Fleas has been cancelled but I feel like it deserved cancellation <laughs> I know. think that uh, for Green Lantern uh, the uh, Red Lantern series. I wasn't a fan of that one. I think that one could be canceled. I don't know if it has been. No. I mean, I, I enjoy him as a side character, but not as an ongoing series. I've read a couple of them, and I just never... Like, it was, it was boring. I've heard that it's improved, but I'm not reading it, so I'm not... <laughs> What's I one may of have the few to, books I'm not reading? I may Who's, have to go revisit it then. Does anyone know who's writing that right now? Charles Soul. Oh, okay, Soul. Yeah, yeah. Okay. The um, she old guy. <laughs> yep. I think that Batman, like, not necessarily could use a cancellation. I think that a couple of the other Batman storylines, what Batman Incorporated, I mean, they could trim the fat on that one and bring it down to, like, one or two titles because it's just, it was too much Batman for me going on. Fortunately, right, Batman right. has something like 15 issues. If you count all of his supporting cast, I think it's up to at least a dozen, you know, maybe 15 issues a month that Batman is is either a star or or one of his protégés is the star of. Yeah, like that's really ridiculous and excessive. Like I understand that he like Batman is a really good money maker, but that like that's a lot. You also have to imagine it's tough to carry a character with that much like mythos being generated like you know, like you've got Batman in two places at once. You're you're trying not to step on like timelines. You're trying not to, you know, change his his uh, personality too much between between any two books, um, maybe because they are concurrent. Um, that's got to just be tough from a editorial standpoint. I mean, that's that's obviously why they have group editors. That uh, I mean, obviously, I don't know who the group editor is on on the Batman family right now, but um, I've got to imagine who is it? Mark Doyle right now. It used to be Mike Martz, but it's Mark. Yeah. Doyle. Mark- yeah, Mart's moved over to Marvel and okay, Doyle, okay. But yeah, anyway, it's 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 an interesting thing. Like, I mean, that's obviously why they have him, right? But um, does anyone have any uh, final thoughts? My final thought is that if you're going to cancel a series, be careful if you're ever going to try and bring it back because a lot of fans will bitch and complain that that was a wonderful series and it needs to be brought back, but when they try and bring it back, they're going for the original like feel and, like, 
uh, energy that that first uh, series had, and you you can never really reproduce that, and it can really bring down not only the characters that were in that book, but just like that book in general, and it kind of um, kills what the first one was. So, I mean, when you say that something was really, really good and needs to be brought back, be careful of how you're bringing that back, and be careful of what you wish for, because you may get something that completely ruins the whole... Um, sensation of that first run. So you're talking like Game of Thrones, Khal Drogo, there's a price for coming back. If I was yeah. a Game of Thrones if fan... any of you guys know what I'm talking about. That's I get it. <laughs> <laughs> you all lose your geek cards. Get, get out of here. Alright, so I think that's going to that's gonna wrap it unless anyone else has anything to say. Um, that's it for this week, I guess. 